we were raiding in small groups, dashed in, fought on, swept out. Scouts are almost in encirclement. We dash into a center of encirclement, begin shooting 360 degrees. Grenade. Crosses, looking for saboteurs on the roofs. About a thousand and a half of them were infiltrated into Cuba a couple of months before the war. Sound of launch rocket. To gotcha. Gotcha. Old man scout. Three salts at the sunburn toast. One flamethrowers passed by. Two tanks T-64 and T-72. Faster than internet. So we've got all the info. I stepped on an anti-personnel mine. It torn away my ankle cap and part of heel. Yet, there are benefits. It was spring in Batman. Trenches were full of mud. I turn on flamingo mode. One leg tucked up standing on the platform. So it or water, who cares? My name is Ivan, alias Nike. 57th separate mechanized brigade. Well, tell us how the full-scale Russian invasion had began for you. Probably it was the same as for the most. In expectation. We sat and waited when it will eventually begin. In general, me and most of my friends and acquaintances had our bags packed before. We knew it and were ready. And we merely waited of when and where. So you had an awareness that full-scale invasion was going to happen. Of course, everyone was ready. One week before it, our guys were stocking up on fuel, various equipment, all sorts of things, in case they needed to supply mobilized young people. They were filling lists of those who was ready to arrive himself. Who knows others ready to come? Preparations went in full swing. On February 23rd, when our guys had gathering in the Turnbull headquarters, they already had a plan and a listing of what they have and what they need. The preparations went on. The invasion was far from unexpected. You were on the war before the full-scale invasion. Yes, I am in the right sector since 2016. We were fighting in the second separate tactical group named after Captain Volovic, then in the first separate tactical group in the separate assault company. So I had military experience. And where exactly did you happen to fight before full-scale invasion? Merzinka Avdiyev, Krasnogorov, Kapiski. We often been in Merzinka by the most. Preparing to the full-scale war, did you communicate with your civilian friends who were far from the military environment, telling them that war is about to come? What was their reaction? Well, if they asked me, I told them it will be. They were like, why? And I told them, cause it has to, how can't it be? That's it, your choice is to believe it or not. Are you a military? He says no. So I say, well, get ready. Either get ready or be waiting or prepare somebody else. And if that person was sort of military, there were no further questions. And my friend were like, will it be? It will. What to do? Nothing. Keep working. It is none of your business yet. So the missile strikes began. What were your next steps? Was it a forming of some group and deployment to some positions? When first fightings happened, yet before the full-scale war we had completed formations ready to be deployed to preset destinations. At half past three in the morning, Atang, we rose and that was it. We were to take a defense at part of the front line designated by Ministry of Defense. And the columns moved on to Kyiv. And where were the very first engagements? They happened closer to Kyiv in the direction of Cherkasy, Kyiv Sumi, over there. Well, what engagements were there? It was like that. We dashed in, shoot around, destroyed something here and there, and returned. We were scooting around and fighting the hardest we could. It was not like setting up the fortifications or prepping tactics. We were like sitting still and then, there are tanks moving. Go burn the tanks. We flew there two grenades, three rockets, all done. There was not plenty of weapons at the beginning, but we felt kind of confidence. With two mines and three RPG, we went to stop the tank column. And there were many like us. The enemy was shocked by that. Do you remember first enemies destroyed by you and your unit? We were capturing diversionists near Kyiv and in the Kyiv itself. Just in a couple of meters from Kreschatik Main Street, we captured a group of saboteurs. They were not that smart despite being a special forces, they gave away themselves. Fighting were held in Kyiv and then in suburbs. Then there were fightings near our base location, we burned artillery. And then we've realized our multitude when they started fleeing and retreating from some locations, leaving behind their corpses, burned machinery, and we gained first trophies. So then, in two or two and a half weeks, a breaking moment had happened when we felt it, well, we are the group, we are the army, we attack and we defeat. And how it was before that one single task, if you see the enemy, hit him. How to switch on Ukrainian wits? Didn't you feel any? Even among the Ukrainian warriors, many 
considered Russians, so-called, the second army of the world. Did you feel any fear of them or not? Well, what fear? Yes, that's clear. When tank is moving on you, you shouldn't jump under its tracks, saying I will disassemble you to bolts. But there was no fear because we were like raiding in small groups, dashed in, fought on, swept out, like urban hooligans of local breed. And there were big units, real army, that stood tight and kept the defense lines. Close to us was the 30th Brigade. They had machines and rendered big battles. While we were sneaking around here and there, here and there, that's it. Kind of subversive reconnaissance groups, like a small assault groups, so to say. You're talking of fightings in Kiev with Russian subversive groups, Russian subouters. I must ask this question because it surely will be asked in comments. Can you tell more about those events? What subouters were those? How did they get into Kiev? Duh, they were living in the apartments for a long time, two or three months before the beginning of war. There were, I can't tell you exactly, as somebody told me, about a thousand and a half of them. They were brought into Kiev yet before the beginning, a couple of months before, silently but steadily, to avoid noticeable traffic. But that's nothing, Spoo had nice listings of who is who. They were chased and catched. That means, some special groups and volunteers, our special services, possessed the information about that Sure, maybe not 100%, but I believe they had 90% of the info. Who, what, where? Here you touched an interesting issue. You said that military made preparations while civilian were not informed to avoid panic. It may seem justified in one way, but in another way. Just recall how many people, literally one day before the full-scale invasion, we're really going to eat barbecues, even book tours to Egypt and Bukovo Sanatorium and so on. Well, in general, everyone knew why it did not work out. The cries peeled from everywhere news America. It could not be that no one knew. The news shouted of America pretelling the war. These say we don't know. Another one says no war. But the war was circling around. Those who were afraid left the country in advance. The war, the danger, so they left. And most of the people were living in a bubble where it was. What war? We are at war since 2014. Some shootings elsewhere. A man from the village got killed. That's all their war is about. They watched the news. One day they've been shown the tank brought from there. That's all their war is about. How could they believe it will spread so wide? But eventually, what if you warn the people? Gas stations crowded. No diesel. Pharmacies sold out. Food stores sold out, each one packed two cars, it all gets rotten there. People are panicking. And now he knows he has three hours. Cores all gas he has in Jerry can, borrows some more from Buddy and pedal to metal. Some fled those who wanted, retained. Those who wanted, retained. Some of them wanted to stay, but there was battle in their village. And they were pushed out, but between shoulders, that's it. Some of them got trapped like hostages, fighting in the village, he can't flee anywhere. That's a war. There was no one like I knew nothing, and then, oh dear, war started. Do you recall some special moments of those fightings in the Kiev suburbs? Was there anything that astounded you, that you still remember? Oh, we had it. Big rush raised when our scouts got into ambush. Got to go help them out. What, where? We've got to go to that place and cover them. Those scouts are encircled. Almost. We dash into a center of encirclement. Begin shooting from RPG 360 degrees. We shoot. Our RPG men were not that experienced yet. Katsitz decided that a mortar shelling had begun. Because we plow the field with RPG. The machine gun shoots 360 degrees. Everyone shoots in all directions. Those begin fleeing. After some five minutes, they realize that we simply drove into the middle and shoot 360 and begun firing in response. Then was our turn to say, oops, got to go, jumped in jeeps, viewed, pedal to metal, that's it. What was going on? One could make movies of it. Something illogical was going on, and they were shocked by that. Then you tell to Yusuf, what did I make? What did I succeed? Yes. Then it's fine. Do you remember first captured Russians? Not just the saboteurs, but maybe the infantrymen or scouts of the professional army. Not just exactly. A prisoner of war is a prisoner of war.
If you ask him of something, he answers you. There was no badasses of the kind knife in teeth. I'll cut my veins, but not surrender. No, the POW is always a POW. Many people say, if you got captured, your task is to do anything you can to survive. That's it. No one will play a hero calling an artillery strike on himself. Got captured. Game over. He tucks his tail between legs and tells and does what he's told to. Was there anything in Russians that surprised you? For example, many people wonder why they were moving in open convoys. Uh, their offense made an impression that they were really preparing for parade marching. When the Kiev will be taken on the third day, did anything surprise you? No, they were not prepared for the parade march. Maybe there was one truck with police batons or dress uniforms. But one truck for the convoy like that is nothing. Yes, their movement in columns made us wonder when we used to burn them. But on the other side, if you don't move in the column, where would you move? The weather was adverse, mud is all around. If the convoy leaves the road, it stucks in the mud and that's it. Artillery blows it off. Plus, they had to seize main roads. That's why they moved along the roads. Well, yes, the practice of columns proved to be rather effective. Yet, they did not plan it well enough and did not succeed in everything they wanted. Somewhere they lacked supplies, somewhere they lacked fuel. Here and there Ukrainian groups were acting. Yes, either gypsies have stolen a tank or something. No avail. No luck at all, poor boys. And then special forces have begun beating their rears. An order was to destroy fuel trucks as a priority. The game was unfolding. Then they buried themselves in the city's earpin and budget. Where the army was holding positions, they stuck in the city and could not advance, and were beaten off there. The same was near Arbaikiv town, they stuck at it, no back, no forth. They send the machinery in, it's beaten, they send the next, it's beaten again. The column entered city, and did not leave it ever. Do you remember your hardest battle in the last year? In the last year it was Kharkiv region. Uh, Izium direction, Soligiko. What was the hardest? We entered it in the battle as a supporting and covering force. Then the situation changed in the course of battle, and we entered the Soligyevka village. It's a two streets village. One side of the village is theirs, another is ours. Their BMPs and tanks were in 300 to 400 meters from us, maybe 500 meters. When we went there, their Orlan unmanned aerial vehicle was permanently floating over, and if two men ran over the field, a pack of Grad missiles was shooed there at once. They did not spare the ammo at all. Mortar Grad, a GS work non-stop. You heard like boo, 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 every three seconds, and only thought of where to hide when it falls. And it was two, two, two. Our battalion commander, Hammer, was killed. The shell had hit him directly. We held our positions for some time, and then we were told of reinforcements sent out. But instead of the reinforcements we were expecting, an orchestra platoon was deployed. Their task was to deliver us something against tanks. I asked them, what are you doing next? They say we were sent to obey your orders. I say, do you remember the way back? We do. Run back then. No matter whether we could to hold there anymore or not. Because when the order came to retreat, because we were pressed hard, we were in the field and the BMP went out behind us and began shooting us in the open field. We crawled into the coppice and they were afraid of entering the forest. And when we got out of there, we met the reinforcements that would have reached us. Could we withstand then or could not we has became a scope of legends. That was one of the hardest battles because the artillery worked mad then. There were tanks, you name it, any movement, and a house with two next to it were burned down. We had heavy losses, and the 93rd Brigade that held defense there had a lot of losses, but we kept on fighting. When we entered that village after the Kharkiv offense repulsed, there were so many burned machines. Maybe one could build a steel plant over there, right? People are looting everything you want there. Come to anyone who left in the village and you'll see an orchard full of machinery, iron and scrap metal. An old man carries armor on the trolley. See an old man pulling a large caliber machine gun on the rope. Behind a horse, I tell thee, it's Ukraine, nothing to say. Laughing a heavy machine gun, he tied it to horse, the horse is pulling it along the ground. Why the heck you took it? I'll put it up as a pole. All right, this will be a neat pole, sturdy one. What do you mostly remember of the civil population? In the Kiev area and in the Kharkiv area, Ah, in the Kyiv region, it was just perfect. 
Once you enter any village, you are met either by the headman or other unclear. Look, they are sitting there, 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 and there. Here you can pass in, and there they've drowned already. Such, such, and such. I have stolen from them these vogs, our pigs, and so on. There is an old yokel. He agreed his house to be burned because they live in there. That's it. Here's a food. Here's water. Here I have a rifle. There are vehicles, bog. I have two tractor drivers and a tractor. Let's go and pull them out. There was one such vital in Kiev area. There's artillery and mortars and all fire but he keeps pulling an empty LB out of mud. Who cares? He pulled a rapper gun when empty LB with rapper stuck in the dirt. We pulled out empty LB then rapper. That was a fearless dude. So at six o'clock in the morning, he's already with us. What are we up to, guys? Was he a local resident? Yes. At nine o'clock he was looking around like, let's look, where has Orlov flown? And the system was established in the cube area. If only some vehicle moves, the message goes through the villages faster than internet. Yep. And we have all the info of what and where. There was an old man scout in one place, we've contacted him later. He had a small block note like this, what does any machinery look like? And when the convoy moved, he was near the highway. Three salts at Yak passed, two tanks, T-64 and T-72, one unidentified, tris, everything. And he reports, guys, such, such and such vehicles pass by in such amount. Wasn't he afraid, understanding that if he gets into Russians' hands, they came into his house and took away his hunting rifle earlier. Enough, he had his blood feud. When they already were burned down and fleeing, it seems like he was hunting them down the road. The dude was so happy, saying that's it, got some. I don't know how did they plan to seize Kiev area. They were robbed by grandmas, poisoned and arsoned, you name it. The people came and told us there's our village, fuckers are in there. Burn it. The people in the Kiev region were quite ideal. You were met with support in any house. Our guys were on subversive raids in the deep rears, and in the cutout villages they entered any house, and found there a shelter, food, civilian clothes and information. There was no denial. Kharkiv region. A bit less than that, but what I mean less, not bad too, but if in the Kiev region everyone was in a shock and a panic at the beginning, when we've got to Kharkiv area everyone was already prepared. Some were at the war, others rendered assistance, no one was running around with kids. Everything went more or less by the plan. People were prepared, got the 1,000 Rivnes pension, donate 700 to Kraken unit, and the Kraken guys fight on. They were fighting very strong for the Kharkiv. What was after Kharkiv region? Where did you take part in the battles? After the Kharkiv region, we've roamed to the old good place, Donbass. That very Bombas, Bakhmet, and the fun has begun. That's it, we've settled in Bakhmet and its outskirts. What was there, Torets in New York? Zaitsev, all the villages and suburbs in front of Bakhmet. And we continued fighting over there. The strategy was different there. It was Donbass like trench war. Tank shoots from afar. By the way, what missions you were set to over there? Was it more of infantry battles? We were still in the ranks of the special forces. We did it all. Artillery targeting, subversive sorties, sniper group and counter-sniper operations, anti-tank missions, you name it. But Donbass is not that much of playground. First, there are many bolded areas. Second, there were old positions that stopped them, where every millimeter is ideally targeted and terrain is well known to us. And they had stuck there because every air tank that approached was burned down. And tanks had to shoot from cover. There was no tank battles, like near Kharkiv, where 20 tanks stormed over the open field. There was more of small infantry groups and artillery, 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 and artillery. Of course, if you're pummeled by artillery and you may guard five kilometers aside, nothing changed. And there you are bound to sit in the trenches and catch the incoming shells. And Bombus has begun being bombed again. So you've returned to your past. Again, that bombus with that soil, that is impossible to dig. Summer is hot and you can't dig in the clay. Winter is frosty and you can't dig in again. Whoa, Donbass is my love. And namely, in the Donetsk area, you've lost a part of your limb, right? May I ask that question? Well, we went out for the reconnaissance raid. Let's name it subversive. To the enemy's rear. And somewhere on the 12th kilometer, I stepped on the anti-personnel mine. It torn away my ankle cap and part of heel. That was it. Our raid was over. They put on a tourniquet. I told my mates, so what, guys? 
Now, I rest, and you do the job. And my mates carried me out by 13 kilometers, by any means available. They got dog tired, of course. I was not the one of lightest. I surely was of 80 then. That's it, 13 kilometers. The stretchers got broken. They carried me on the rifles, belts, on some poles, on the broken trolley with straw and dung, on something else. That was awful. Well, there was no fun at all. Now it may look merry. And then it was hot. Stretchers broken. What to do? Let's do it without it. Let's carry him on hands. What hands? Let's use a board. And there's tall grass, coffins, all that. Nevertheless, they carried me out in two hours. That's a very good result. Yes, then the guys ended up in the hospital with spinal problems due to the hard workload. Well, they delivered me to the known point about 500 meters from our positions and called 72nd Brigade for help. Then our men quickly arrived and helped to carry me these half kilometer, placed me in the car and delivered to the hospital in Bakhmut. Didn't the Russian occupants disclose your group after the mine exploded? Most probably they did. When the mine exploded, I felt the tinnitus and could not hear anything. Tumult and panic. But we left that place very quickly. I made about 150 to 200 meters away jumping on one leg. And we hid in the lowland where the grass was high up to the waist. They shoot, actually, because I catched a bullet in my left leg on the way. I did not even realize when and how did it happen. All of us were exhausted and out of breath, sweated as hell. It was hot summer, and it was four o'clock and feet are cold from the dew, the head is hot from the sun, and I got the bullet in the leg. I can't recall when. They told me in the hospital, there's a bullet in your leg. So I was like, it happens. Good, that was me and not someone else. Surely we would not make it out. And that's it. Of course they shoot, because if something explodes in your rear it means something. Where those mines are planted long ago. Maybe they thought it was boar and were hungry. Don't know. Laughter muscle is hard to understand. You are narrating it so vividly now. Well, the impression is like you were bitten by a mosquito and not a mine blew up. Well, what can I do? You don't want your foot torn off, don't step on land mine. Enough said. Well, if I stepped on it, so what? What to do? Now, I have a stake foot. Laughter. One sock I can change only when it is rubbed off, and there are benefits. It was spring in back, but trenches were full of mud. I turn on flamingo mode, tucked up one leg, standing on the panel. Is it snow or water? Who cares? And you'll never bruise your little toe walking. It has its benefits, really. I can park my car where I want, you know. Laughter. Now I am honored. I can drive into any handicapped parking. That's it. Laughter. Listen, when your fellows carry you, can you tell us what were your thoughts at the moment? Oh, how I pitied them. You are looking at him and try to talk to him, but he only can tell you, lie still, it's all right, lie still, and he's sweating all over, ought to carry. Our group comprised of four men, one got injured, and three ought to carry him, either one is carrying and it awkward or another. If we were five, then four men would do it better, and there's only three, and one's undecided whether he's got to carry me alone, or he's not needed, or he's got to clone himself, or what. They exhausted. When they had arrived, they were so weary. So you spoke of the trenches and of yourself being in trench on a prosthesis. Did you return to the war after the injury and loss of the feet? I stepped on the landmine on 9th of June. On July 28th, I could walk already. I arrived to Bakhmet, but they told me, dear, this will not do. Go and pass the medical commission. You're no warrior without a paper. And I went back to Kmelinsky to make a piece of paper that I am partially fit and able to hand out a shell. And that's it. They made it. And I returned. I can't recall the date. I was in Bakhmet in the sniper group. We climbed slabs. We worked. And it was so deadly boring at home. And then there were blackouts, curfew hours, sirens. You sit at home scared and shocked. Thinking, wish I were at Donbass. There are only shells and tanks, nothing more. And here it's full set blackout, something's burning. Small crosses painted on the ground, people with spotlights at night wiping them off. Everyone's squinting at you, looking for saboteurs where there aren't any. What was going on? Having a choice, I'd better return to the army instead of being a civilian like that. No, no, no. Only the army. Laughter. There it's simple, you've got the rifle, he's got the rifle, you shoot at each other, fine. And what was going on here? What a fancy people were turning on, that one can't cross the border. This one sits in house for a year lest be taken to the army. These, I say, are climbing roofs looking for the cross marks left by diversionists. And the guy had sneezed in a wrong place, catch a diversionist. They threw him on the ground, punched his muzzle and brought him to police. If you go to the forest for mushrooms, you may even be shoot dead. My God. No, it was more dangerous over there. Don't give me that. 
Listen, but your injury. You have to install prosthesis, right? Did you have that feeling? They often write in a social network that it is hard to get adapted to return to the full-scale life. I had a good pattern. When I have received a prosthesis, I stood on it with a crutch. But it's uncomfortable, it's painful, and not well. My friend said, I will help you. We sat. Uh, come on, let's rinse your prosthesis. So we sat and emptied a bottle talking. Had a drink. I need a toilet, so I stood up and went there. Then I came back like, oh, my crutch is left here. It turns out I can walk. If I walked once, it's okay. Let's skip the bottle story. That is, your friend had helped you. A friendly support is so important. Alcoholism. Laughter. A serious male alcoholism helped me on my feet. And by the way, it helped me cope phantom pains. The phantom pains are more in the head. They are not physical. Painkillers do not help, absolutely. And the doctor tells me, look, you either need a strong pills, and you'll lie like a vegetable. Or, he says, I don't know, try something. So I used to take a little of alcohol. It damped my pain, and I could sleep. And in a week it came to the point when on feeling phantom pains I used to take a bottle and pour a glass but did not even drink. Just put it near and fell asleep. My brain was like, the cure is here. It's like the smoking addiction. When you don't have cigarettes, you are dying to smoke. And when you have them, don't care. The same was here. And that's it, but everything's okay. I walked. I walk in the park. And it is about to rain. Am I able to run or am not? I... Tin, tin, tin. All I can... I can run. I ran 500 meters, okay, enough for Donbass. And we've been already transferred to the infantry then. Uh, why run? Jump in BMP and let's go. Aren't we worth it? How long have you been on the front line after the trauma and on the prosthesis? Since I went to there in August, I only returned once to replace prosthesis. Because the stump slims, and it's a bit beyond the rules to fight on a half leg. The stump had to slim, so I returned to get smaller prosthesis and then went back. And again, it was back at Kharkiv and where else we traveled. Now I have injured my knee, so in a couple of weeks we will get it fixed and I'll go back. What do your relatives say? I mean partial loss of the leg prosthesis front line again. Do you speak to them in the same cheerful tone? So what I shall tell them? It's like talking to a dog. If I'm on the war since 2016, at first I was concealing it from them, did not tell them. Then they got to know I had one wound, then another. I did not tell them either till they catched me. It useless. On the February 24th, they call me, where are you now? They don't ask me, do you go? Uh, I say, I'm on my way, got it. Because what you say if the man is on the war for so many years, and it's not his first time when you have to worry, oh dear, what he's going to do with that rifle. I hope he will not shoot himself. The man is knowing. He was brought up like that. If you can, if you know, you've got to stand at defense. It was not like, oh, don't go, we'd better send my caller. He's a drunkard anyway. It was not like that. Everyone knew, if you're able and aware, you've got to go and do the job. That's it. Of course, they worry. They told me, be careful, like that. But there was nothing like, won't you stay? Won't you better go picking strawberries in Poland instead? What would you recommend to the guys who'd lost their limbs as well? Got wounded, but were not as prepared as you. No one is really prepared. How could one be? I had a comrade, a friend who'd got an explosion back in 2017 to 18. And when I have got my foot torn off, it was amputated. On the way to Mechnikov Hospital in Dnipro, I called him. Hello, brother. Cheers. What to do? The situation is this, I have lost my foot. He says, oh, greetings, be ready for such and such, do this and this and write to me thereafter. And that's it. I saw him walking, I saw other people walking before. And now my friend is also in hospital with his foot torn off. He arrived to hospital and said, okay, what shall we do? This, this and this. The friend says, got it. And he will not think of the wheelchair. He says, give me the prosthesis. I want to walk. My fellows are out for barbecue. Why am I in a wheelchair? No good. Things have changed now. Even the society changed. Many people are on prostheses and can walk. And now there are so many people on prostheses with torn limbs. Before you were one in a million and everyone squinted at you. This one has an iron leg. Sussy pussy, let's give him way or he can stumble. And now how iron leg? Walk through the puddle. Why should you bypass it? That's it, that's fine. The attitude changes. You perceive it better. You did not lose your foot because of freezing it in the bushes while sleeping drunk. It had been torn off prosaically. I managed to bring my foot to Dnieper. Yet they took it away over there. Or I would marinate it in the jar and put on a shelf. That's cool. They ask where is it? Over there. That would be. Pity they took away my foot. 
The boys and girls that are on the front line are rather surprised by those civilians who are chilling in the bars, abusing their situation, and neither go to the army nor assist the army at all. What do you feel towards them? I am against the system about this. If you are fighting, you do it for the sake of living of the cities, all that. Of course, there are individuals who get cocky. Then the situation is simple. We are under martial law. Smack his facade face, crumble his teeth to the asphalt, and that's it. No use of explaining or arguing, oh, it will not do, we are at war. He is no fool nor blind. As he came here, so he can leave here. Smack his facade, that's it. A knee shot through changes one's mind very well, drastically. A person stands on a right track, shows understanding all up. It's a wide spectrum remedy. Apart from that, of course, people shall relax. Take me. I came home for ten days leave, took off the uniform, and I want to rest. And even to recall what it is like to sit in a bar with friends, or to go out to a disco or barbecues or fishing. I want to forget the war and all for ten days. Of course, you will not forget it. You think of that, my colon. Had not he blew off himself, cause you gave him an Oz landmine, and he does not know what's it. Maybe he's hammering nails with it. Anyway, you want to distract myself, to forget it, to go out somewhere. Here we're sitting in the park. It's nice, people are promoting. But if there was a block post, and here was a peon with rifle, no, that's no good. Now I can see, oh, that's cool, that's a peaceful life. Of course, everyone must know that we are at war and need help, and so on, and so on. Yet, the majority of those promenading have acquaintances in the military. They know just well what the war is about. One knows it, he opens Facebook in the evening. Oh, Siri writes, I need Mavic 3. Okay, cut it. They gather 10,000, 20,000, buy it. He's made his donate. We need it, we need millions of those drones, we need millions of cars, cause they're expendable. They always burn, break down, get shot down, again, again, and again. It's the same as with cartridges. Take 30 cartridges, but don't you shoot them. Keep them with you, but don't shoot. What's this? And people shall have jobs, business shall run. Even that nightclub. It pays taxes, okay. Everything shall be decent, modest, and rational. If any air raid alert, hide. Or let the nightclub work only on Saturdays. And let it be not in the center or near the hospital, but somewhere in the uptown, make a list of approved venues, and reinforce all the patrols at night. Cause now those who hides from the draft letters are riding at nights, and don't go anywhere at day. How people can live being afraid of draft letter escapes me. There are people who don't leave their homes for a year or even a year and a half. He does not go out of house lest be taken to army. You go out or not, you'll soon die from tuberculosis anyway. You'll have better chances to survive in the army. There are such people. I am shocked with this, but they exist. I would not sit at home. When I'm asked what if you did not go to army back then, I say, I would have gone by now anyway. If not, I would be a complete drunkard. I know how one can sit for a year and a half, hoping that maybe the writ misses him, maybe he will not be taken to the army. No, such a man must have a ruined nervous system. Only two years ago, practically, no one talked about a victory over Russian occupants. Now, judging by recent events, looking at two years or at nine years of the war, can you forecast what will it be? Why no one talked? There were those who talked. My buddy told me if needed, I have contacts who know. As he says, I have a buddy who has a buddy who has a buddy who works at a nuclear station. And we, Shurik Shurik, will make a small nuke bomb and smash them. Yes, everyone knew it will be hard. Now it's not a time for that. I should say, in 2015, we had one assault rifle for five men and raided with Mosin's rifles. All looked kind of weird. When you see some Iskanders and MiG-35s on television, while you ponder how to shoot the grenade from the slingshot to make it fly further, and now everything changed dramatically. Army had changes. You could see those changes. And that Nozalazny's approach had great effect. The proper person's head came. Whatever the man had simply turned the army to the right way, he did like that. He did not play games and was not shy about names. If you are bad general, off you go. That's it. The key generals whom he put in place did not flee or get lost. All of them are here, and he knows we are at martial law. Each man has his responsibility. He distributed control clearly, increased role of sergeants. He changed many things in the army. 
He is far from dumb person. He knows what to do. He puts everyone in the right place. Even at the beginning of the war, everyone saw, oops, somehow this tank stands here and beats enemy's convoy. And there's an aircraft strikes something and there and there. It is not for no reason. And somehow at four o'clock in the morning, when they said Ukraine has no aviation, it's destroyed. At four o'clock, all the aircraft were in air and we had not lost a single aircraft. There are guys, your brothers in arms, who've been summoned recently. And we know that there are quite a few problems that sometimes fellows come untrained. What would you recommend them? As they say, I was not born with Kalashnikov and knife in the teeth and with fearlessness on top, with a sign warrior on the forehead. Like if when my mom bore me, she saw it on my forehead military. No one did it at once. Everyone learned and trained. Darn it, a year and a half of war, you know that you might need to defend. Go and learn, learn to shoot at least, get skills. Buy yourself a uniform, a pocket vest. If you don't need it, you'll hand it over to other guys. So you will not be like, oh, what to do? Where are our military? When your house is shelled. Military. Everyone is a military. You can be trained in a month or two. We are thrown at tanks naked and barefoot. Surely. With a slipper in the right hand and stale sausage in the left. Of course. And this naked and barefoot against tanks. Oh, I'm pissed off with it. There's a certain pattern. If you're an infantry, your task is a spade and a rifle. Dig and shoot. That's it. Cause you will be augmented by tankists, and they are trained to drive a tank. These TikTok warriors, we're not given a tank. I need F-35 to successfully complete toilet cabin capturing mission. Five of them. And an aircraft carrier. I can't do without it. Give him a tank. Here's your tank. What to do with it? I cannot shoot with it. And give him a diesel. And give him a trailer to carry it. Why do you need a tank if you can't handle it? So if you are infantry, your task is to burrow in the ground. You will be covered by tanks who've been attached to you. They know how there's aviation and artillery and all. No, all the our people think that if they came to war, they will be like, strike with three missiles there for me and two over there and bring me a car to take me to the trench. I will sit there, open a can of coal, smoke a cigarette, and will show where to shoot the Heimers. There are such people who are far from army. And there are wimps who imagine. There was a subversion group attacking us 30 times. Three times hit us with a nuclear missile. We cannot hold that defense line. That's all. I am contest. He says, I have a head problems. I have shot three times, and I am contest till now. People are different. There are guys, one of them is my friend, who has as many those concussions as an idiot has candy wrappers. He even sneezes each time differently. And he's still in the ranks. When I sneeze too hard, I pass out, he says. And he's okay. Came to sense, shaken off the dirt, and keeps fighting. And I say, there are persons with problems in the head. Not just one and not two head bruises. Yet, that's not essential. Whether they draft you or not, be ready. Get trained. A year and a half have passed. Stop hiding. Get trained. Come and say, I want to be a drone pilot. I want to be an artillerist. Or, my hands are asking to let me be in supply so I will not occasionally shoot my comrades. Somebody has to deliver munitions, shells, do the logistics, lots of needs. Cook the food eventually. Right? Cook the food as well. We have some people who thinks, ah, oh, this is a cook, he is a dunk. But if he does not cook your food, you'll die from hunger. Who cares that you have a tank if you die from hunger? You'll sell that tank and surrender because you have nothing to munch. There are no unimportant persons or things. There may be an unimportant general because he's ignorant. And for him too, and two is 17 for the third year. And all the personnel is vital for something. In army there's nothing like let this guy just be here. We will invent for him something later on. Nothing like that. Thank you for the conversation. I wish you a strong health and a soonest victory which you are fighting for for so many years. Thank you. Heavy metal. Beware of landmines. Do not step on them.